objective in uh, our objective in this whole study is really to better understand the bigger picture of God um, and is dealing with humanity from generation uh, from Genesis to Revelations. That's kind of the way I look at this. Uh, I'm always thinking the big big picture, the blueprints, what's in God's mind when he did everything he's done, you know, in, in our human history. And so we see that uh, studying this, it kind of helps us better rightly divide the word of truth as we can study any part of the Bible and have a better understanding of it from his eternal plan perspective. And of course, we've often emphasized over and over his eternal plan was the revelation, the mystery hidden from ages and generations. Uh, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, and which we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. We know that the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. And so we know that those were um, primary texts in understanding the eternal plan of God. That is the foundational um, truths that we're coming from, from that perspective as we go through the Old, Old Testament in the other dispensations. So we see as and better understand his sovereignty throughout time, how God dealt with humanity. That's that's the thing we're looking at today in the last couple of weeks, how he dealt with humans and to really seek his mind in that regards. And so, and we, and I believe um, that in understanding these dispensations, it would give us a greater appreciation of the apostle Paul in the dispensation we're living in. It's just amazing on, on the grace and the mercy God has given us and the truth and the light he's given us also um, in, in from the word and from Paul's gospel. So um, we see the big picture here in um, this whole illustration and we're still in between Adam and Moses. We've been in this time period uh, for the last, this is our, what, third week, I believe, or fourth week? Must be our fourth week. And so we've been hanging out in this part of time period of God. And this is good for us to go back in time. I've also, I often have, you know, been blessed even from the Old Testament as we go back in time. We're literally going back in time. And what the scriptures are, are a windows. It's a peak uh, in the past that we can visually see uh, God's divine uh, interaction with man. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. I, I've, I've been blessed. We're blessed to see how God has preserved the word, the scriptures, in this whole entire history that we can go back and study it and read it. And so, uh, and that's what we're doing. We're going back in time right now, thousands of years ago, and looking at this period of time of history and how God has dealt with humanity in innocence, in conscience, in human government, and in promise, in which we're gonna start today, but we'll probably need to continue that next week as I'll be ending a little short today, comparatively speaking. And so we begin the timetable here with, um, with humanity, excuse me, here as I move my screen around a little bit, uh, get it out of the way. Um, so one of the things I wanted to note in our study today, couple, several things, but is how God speaks and interacts with the key characters of each dispensation. Um, and we see in the Old Testament, God never really spoke to the masses. He really spoke to individuals. And that's the amazing thing we have today is that God speaks to the individuals, all of us individually. It's just one of the grace of God and, and how he's dealing with today. And he talks and speaks to each and every one of us where in the Old Testament, it was only in certain individuals as we see in Hebrews chapter one, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, 
has in these last days spoken to us individually by his son in whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. And so it is amazing to think about that. Remember, God only spoke to one or two individuals in the past. And today he speaks in every one of our hearts. And so what a blessing that is. So in each dispensation, keep in mind, and we're going to really emphasize this, God reveals himself <clears throat> to that group of people during that time period, or at least individuals within that time period. And so he kind of turns the light of his nature, his character and attributes to those who are living during that time, at least to those who were, you know, hungry or uh, sensitive to God, he's revealing himself, his character, and his purpose to some degree. And in each dispensation, he's working out certain truths, and principles, key components that has a cumulative effect up to our present time, as we mentioned last week in that regards, and that we're living in. And so throughout the timetable of God's dealing, uh, it, the revelation is progressive. And I show this illustration from here. When you see it's, it's a continuous progression of truth in each dispensation as we come along here. And now we're at the top of these stairs looking backwards. We're in this grace period as we showed in our previous time period, right at the end of this grace period. It's a gradual step-by-step -step truths that he gives us and reveals to us. And in the Old Testament, basic, the real key scarlet thread, as they say, is the Lamb of God and the redemption of humanity. That's primarily the main truths that he is making known in the Old Testament to basically his people at that period of time in that dispensation. And so it gradually, so we'll be looking through this time period of the Old Testament to see this truth come out in each one of these dispensations. And so remember, revelation of God is progressive through human history, even our own human history, which we call the church age from, from the time of Christ's resurrection to the present time, even then, in a sense, it's been progressive throughout history since Paul died um, in the last voice of the epistles in the New Testament that uh, were, were died in. And we still see that progression take place even to this present day. And so we're seeing in this present truth a mystery being revealed to us that was hidden from those generations of past. And that's kind of where the, one of our foundational verses here, the mystery which has been hidden from all the patriarchs, from the Jews, from all those, the prophets of past generations, but now is, has been and is being revealed to his saints, you and I, this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that's the founding foundation of truth that we build on. And that's a perspective we're looking back at in these dispensations. And so we see, I drew these little pictures here, the sun light, and that is Christ, the sun in us. And that's where we're heading into eternity with God and in the millennial period of time. So in each dispensation, as I mentioned, God is revealing himself. And so in, let's go back a little bit and see the progression of truth that's taken back, a little bit of review from what we covered before. And in the past, in, in the dispensation of innocent, God spoke directly to Adam in more of a commandment and instruction as we understand for what to do and basically what not to do. We don't know much other than that, other than what the scripture is saying. And um, we do know his instructions, so. though. And so the truth that brings out in the first dispensation is the creation of the universe. 
and the creation of man and woman as a living soul. That's the divine revelation we still hang on to. Do you know that these, the first three chapters probably of Genesis is the most studied chapters and verses in the Old Testament, period. More Christian churches and ministers and theologians study those three chapters more than any other part of the Old Testament. And so we still are digging truth out of that, those three, first three chapters. It seems like that's where we start. <laughs> if anything, in the Old Testament, we grab those three chapters and, and bring them jump to the New Testament. So we see the act of union of marriage between man and wife, which symbolizes, and Paul said, it is a mystery which concerns Christ and the church. That's our union with Christ. We see in the first dispensation, the tree of life, which symbolizes Jesus, which they did not partake of, and by which God literally cut them off from partaking of it once they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We see in this first dispensation, the freedom of choice that God gave humanity and the importance of obedience in the word of God. We see God directly, clearly directs his creature exactly what to avoid, i.e. the knowledge and the knowledge that man will live by and govern the world, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We see it is started and initiated in this dispensation. In this dispensation, we see that God introduces the serpent, the devil, the opposite of God himself. And so at some juncture, God decided in his eternal plan to uh, design this opposite of himself and put him obviously in the garden and, and disguised as a serpent. And he placed them by which God would use this devil as the opposite of himself to show the contrast and give humanity that option to choose the opposite of God. And we know that from that, the opposing forces of God and everything he stands for in this world comes from Satan, the devil. And we say in our study of redemption, he's the master and prison warden of the fallen human race. He's the father, if you will, of the children of wrath, as Paul later says in Ephesians. And then again, we see in this dispensation, the judgment of God against sin and the fall of humanity. So there's many truths that we see. And some, one of the things we never studied in this, which I've heard other teachers say, there's two accounts of the creation of man in this whole study. The first study or that God created man and woman in the image of God. And there's another version, which we won't go into at this point. And God created man and then took a woman from the rib of man. So that was a unique, you wonder what, why was there two accounts in that? But we thank God that he gave um, Moses this divine revelation and truth to write these verses some 2,500 years later and revelation of truth that he penned down that's been preserved as we study the book of Genesis. So keep that in mind. What a tremendous revelation that he gave Moses to write these in this truth. And so from the light of the, disp from the dispensation of conscience, we probably have less truth and light. I, I'm sure people can dig more than we've studied, but it's probably one of the least studied um, dispensations. Um, we do know that once that transition period from conscience, and we know we said Adam and Eve were those individuals that um, kind of transferred from the old, from the first dispensation and the next dispensation, their eyes were open the widest. And we know that um, God spoke to them again directly in this dispensation. And basically the punishment to the devil and, and the curse he played, uh, placed on um, 
the devil and the the judgment that he that he placed on Adam and Eve and humanity. Probably the most probably God spoke also to Enoch during that time, and Enoch walked with God, and we'll read a little bit more about him in, in Hebrews. In this dispensation, God symbol, symbolically re revealed the only means of redemption for fallen humanity was the sacrifice and the blood of a lamb. And we see that initially God made clothing from skins of animals. We probably, Adam and Eve probably witnessed at that time, God, you know, sacrificing perhaps a lamb of some sort, and then um, using the hide of that animal to produce clothing for them. And we see that um, Genesis 3, 3 and 4, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. So Cain, we see, represents the first kind of act of self-righteous act of, of human effort in order to be justified before God. And that's kind of what we see from Cain. He said, hey, listen, I labored. Look at all the work I've done. You know, the field, these vegetables, <laughs> you know, this offering of, of the vegetables and of the ground. And God said, no, that's, I don't accept human works as justification, basically, is what's going on here. But, but to Abel, who sacrificed um, an animal and offered it to God, recognizing that it's not based on human effort that we can be uh, justified. It's by a, uh, the sacrifice of a lamb. And so this tells us that both Adam and Eve also knew the need to sacrifice a lamb for their sins. And he taught, they taught their children. It must have been because we're able to even do that. They must have been known that at that time. And so and then in, in the latter part of this dispensation, God spoke directly to Noah. And I've always been amazed at Noah um, and the specific instructions on how to build an ark. So it's quite amazing how he did that. And we see also the consequences of sin and the choices that man makes through this dispensation. So those are the kind of the truths. We don't see a lot of other activity other than the lineage of humanity or of God, of God from Adam all the way through to, to Noah during this dispensation. Um, uh, also, uh, a large amount of time had transpired between Adam and Eve's family and Noah. We knew that period of time. Remember, we said there's over 1,500 years, if I'm not mistaken on that. We see the huge judgment of humanity on earth against the entire population, God's judgment of man against the wickedness. We see in the end there the when the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thought of his hearts was evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I mean, that's, that's quite a judgment that he placed on them, except for one man and his family. The ark in this dispensation represents Christ and salvation, and Noah is the only recipient to receive the grace of God. During the, in his family during this time, only recipient. Can you imagine that of all the humanity there? But Noah and his family found grace in the eyes of the Lord and were saved from the judgment of God. It's quite amazing to think about. Somehow, some way, God chose this one individual, Noah, and he spoke to Noah during this time period. And remember, during these early dispensation, there was no churches, there was no gathering of believers, there was no preaching, there was nothing of that sort, where they gathered together and worshiped together and talked about God and, 
his goodness and his character. No, they're just individuals, all living individual lives. And yet God found somebody who had a tender heart. And through the lineage, obviously from Adam, it goes on in this dispensation. Interesting what Hebrews has to say. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtain a good testimony. By faith, we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, being dead still speaks. By faith, Enoch, here, here comes Enoch, was taken away so that he did not see death, interesting, and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. What a tremendous statement. What, what a tremendous testimony you have through history that we have been reading for thousands of years that the Jews were reading for thousands of years, the testimony of Enoch was penned. You know, what, what, a, what a testimony that is for each and every one of us to have, that our testimony was and is that we please God. I think of Jesus, I do all things that please the Father. And that's our hearts to please him. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Here's Noah, by faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with God, godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. I know it for me is one incredible individual in the Old Testament, one amazing patriot. Can you imagine to receive the instructions to build an ark? How obscure that must have been at that time. I mean, there was no great lakes as we know it or oceans. They, knew of or any place near i don't even know what they had during the time but to build this massive boat and the ridicule he must have had because he built it on dry land from far from wherever and that you can't transport especially during that time and say hey let's get the big huge vehicles and transport it to the lake and he's for years He's having to trust God and follow these instructions until the entire ark was built. And then to take in some kind, somehow, some way, God divinely, miraculously brought in all the animals. It's quite an amazing feat to me of, of what basically Noah did. I think that was a phen phenomenal act of of obedience and, 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 and faith that he continued for how many years it took him to build 80 years or whatever it took him. Uh, there's some numbers on there. So anyway, um, and then we come to now the present of the dispensation of promise. This is the overview of the dispensation of promise. Um, basically the promise of God, covenant with Abraham, unconditional, based upon faith alone. We see Abraham called his seed and is promised to bless all people of the earth. We see um, a trust issues. Do not, and, and basically this was the instructions of, of, of God to, to Abraham. Do not go down to Egypt. And of course, Abraham did in a disobedient act. And we see the end of this dispensation in a sense that it was a judgment where Israel were enslaved for 400 years. And uh, we see this time period is about 430 years. I don't know exactly how they come up with these numbers. 
It's from Genesis 12, 1 to Exodus, all the information we have during this period. And we see and know that the main char uh, character was Abraham. Basically, the main overall was event or truth that God calls Abraham, gives him the promises and the covenant. But we see also an important time here that uh, it's the founding of the Jewish nation, Israel. Abraham is the father of the Jewish nation. So at this juncture, we kind of have to think about here, God, instead of dealing with all individuals separately, he's now going to bring about a people he's going to choose. This is a select group of people. So here's where the beginning, if you will, of family, a people of God, and not just individuals, a corporate body. And so in the heart and the mind of God, because we know eventually God's going to bring, we are the people of God in God. And this was the beginning and the start where he's going to gather together his people that he's going to make known himself to versus the masses. And so we see this taking place during this time. And so the two main doctrinal principles behind this dispensation, Abraham's covenant was based upon God's promises to Abraham concerning the creation of the Jewish race and the area, the real estate that the Jews would possess someday as citizens of the first and the last client nation in history. This is a natural part of the promises concerning the Jews and the nation of Israel and the land they will possess someday forever. So God's still in this promise that he's going to fulfill one day to Israel. They will have a special place for them. It's kind of uniquely different. We won't try to mix and match at this point in time, but it's future tense. But this Abrahamic covenant also has a spiritual aspect to it for you and I, all born again believers to both the Jews and the Gentiles, which is by faith. The faith aspect is really comes into play for believers. And so we have, even Abraham comes into the scene approximately 400 years after the flood. Most likely everyone at that time had heard stories of the flood. There's some knowledge of it. It was most likely more common that 400 years after the flood, it was still, there's probably a lot happening then. Um, they probably had a consciousness of God, the creator, the God of Noah someplace. You think about Abraham, because remember, no churches, no pastors, no priests, no gatherings. They're just individuals living life. Keep in mind that, yeah, I said that there, as far as we know of, there was no priest. The practice of regular gathering of like-minded spiritual people, there was nothing at that point. And here it, Abraham comes in and God speaks to Abraham directly and gives him the promise. Now think about this a moment, out of the blue, out of just, God starts to speak to Abraham and he chose Abraham. And I can't imagine what it must've been like during that time for Abraham. I mean, remember God didn't speak to the masses. So this was a, an unusual event. Now the Lord said to Abraham, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing and I will bless you and those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you and you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham departed. So Abraham listened and he immediately obeyed. So this was quite an act of God. And Abraham knew without a doubt. Wow, pretty powerful event that took place here in this interaction between God and Abraham. And I'm always amazed that we have this whole 
dialogue going on. And so Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him and lot with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abraham took Sarah's wife and Lot, his brother's son, and their possessions that they had gathered and the people whom they had acquired in Haran. And they departed to go in the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And so here's the promise again in another section of scriptures. And he said, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham for I have made you a father of many nations. And I'll make you exceedingly fruitful and make nations of you and kings shall come to you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I will give you your descendants after you in the land in which you are a stranger. All the land of Canaan is an everlasting possession. I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout all their generations. This is my covenant that you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of the foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Now, keep in mind, so this was the first act of God in circumcision. I was that funny. I was asking Sister Mile about this, you know, can you imagine a whole people group, right? Well, not two men said, okay, here's the new instructions of God. All right, all you men get over in the tent. We're going to perform a circumcision on you at all different ages. I often thought that was kind of funny. And this is our obedience to God. And so, uh, and they were identified by this. And so, but Paul goes along and, Romans and sees the real purpose of circumcision. That was not an outward sign, but an inward. But he is a Jew, which was one is which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in spirit and not of the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. And Paul kind of addresses circumcision in the New Testament and a number of places when he's dealing with the Jews and explaining the purpose of circumcision and not of the flesh, but of the heart. And so I'm gonna close in this last section because when you think about this dispensation, it's really an issue of God's promise to humanity. It's God's promise to Israel and the promised nation that will come forth from Abraham being the founding father but it is really, I was just thinking of the promise that God gives to you and I, even in the Old Testament scriptures, of all the promises that we have based on this dispensation and going forward to both the Jews and to believers as well. We have many promises still. And I often think about that. I, Paul says in a number of places, by which we have been, or this is Peter, Peter chapter two, I think it's four, by which we have been giving to us exceeding great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him, amen, unto the glory of God for and by us, excuse me. So I think about the promises. I, I still to this very day hang on to a lot of promises, even though I don't see always the evidence in the physical. We hang on to, I, I still read the Psalms. I like the Psalms in many places. Sometimes God speaks to me during in, in the Psalms in certain specific ways to me directly. It's kind of a little rhema word that he speaks to me. And one of the chapters in, the Psalms that God has spoke to me over the years is Psalms 37. I didn't write the reference here, 
But it's interesting, even it seems like every now and then I'll read this chapter and there's certain things that got pops out to me. And what, just the other day I was reading and looking at the whole events of the world and frustrated and my, my mind and heart was a little bit troubled. And I started reading Psalms 37 and it really encouraged me. And basically it was the Holy Spirit saying, Roger, don't fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of workers of inequity, for they shall soon be cut down like grass and wither as the green herb. So all these evil, corrupt, manipulative things that are happening around the world, even through governments, through pharmaceutical companies, through businesses that's happening even in today, don't worry, don't fret about it. Don't let it be bothered. Don't let your heart be troubled, as Jesus said. And then verse three, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. It's always been that. We've, we've dwelt in a lot of different countries. It's always the time that the father changes the, the, the place that we live, the the bounds of our habitation. He plucks us up from one country and moves us to another and he sets us down. He said, okay, now I want you to dwell in the land there, trust in God and do and be about my business and just feed on my faithfulness. God speaks to our heart. I often liked verse four, delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. That's, that's a truth that still rings out. I think the more you and I delight ourselves, give ourselves totally to the Father. God changes our hearts and our own desires, and then he then in turn fulfills those hearts by Christ, those desires in our heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And that's another promise. That's something we continue to do over and over, Father. We get a little strayed from here to there, go about our own thing and our own work, and we kind of lose track and we re kind of focus on you and what you have for us. We commit our way. We were reminded of that continuously to trust no matter, not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. And I like what he says. He shall bring forth your righteousness as a light and your justice as a noonday. Rest in the Lord. Again, spoken to you and I. And wait patiently for him. Don't fret because of him who prospers in his way. Because of the person who brings wicked schemes to pass. Don't fret. And again, it's a reminder because you see it all around us. How can these evil, corrupt leaders continue? How can these people who deceive continue in leadership? And continue these evil, corrupt individuals? But God says, one day they're going to be cut down. And so... For the, I like verse 10, uh, uh, over for nine, for evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they'll share inherit the earth for a little while and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully to his place, but it shall be no more. The meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. And the Lord laughs at him. For he sees that his day is coming. I like this. The wicked have drawn the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor, to slay those who conduct. And then he goes on. He said, but their sword shall enter their own hearts and their bows shall be broken. And he goes on and talks about more of this. But let's jump down to the last part here, to Second Peter. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and new earth, wherein dwells the righteousness. That's what we look for. And this is the promise that he promised us, even eternal life. That's what keeps us going forward, this promise that we're going to be in eternity with him. And that's what we invest our life in. That's what we hold on dearly. That's what no matter what happens in this world, this world we live in is only temporary. 
you know, it's really, that's what we got to constantly remind ourselves, no matter what you go through, as Paul always says, don't look at the things which are seen all around us that just causes us to worry and fret and fear, but look at the eternal things of God that are at work and in which is even though our light afflictions, our problems, our trials, our tribulations is only for a moment, are at work in us a far more eternal weight of glory for we're heading to our Father's house. And that's the promise. And so we'll go on, but I'm going to jump ahead and we're going to have to end it there. But really what I want you to do in this breakaway session as I have to end early is we have to, we're actually heading out today. Um, what are the key takeaways you're thinking about and you learned just speaking and what the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you during this few minutes that we've been together? Why does God test his people? Why does God make promises that won't be fulfilled until after the person dies in many cases? How does God fulfill certain promises differently from person to person? And one thing, if nothing else, I'd like you to discuss and share a small testimony of a specific promise that God has given to you. And it would be more in the natural sense, personally, and has fulfilled it. Something he's promised you, you knew it in your heart, and you saw the fulfillment of that, share something of that testimony and share a verse that you hang on to that you say, this is the promise God gives, has given me and I hang on to that. So,